Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind, episode 108. The way humanity has always learned has been unlike what we impose in school. So we're actually imposing so much more on narrow way of learning that we actually kind of we kind of smother it. You know, you have to get to be, say, 30 or 40 years old before you start thinking, what am I really passionate about? And what if, you know, what did I lose along the way? Benjamin Franklin once said, do not curse the darkness, rather light a candle instead. If you're ready to set your mind on fire, then prepare yourself for the Luminous Mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is Laura Grace Weldon. Laura is an author of Free Range Learning. The Handbook of Natural Education is heavily researched and resource-packed, plus it shares the wisdom of over 100 homeschooling families from around the world. Laura lives on a bit of farm heaven where she works as an editor and marginally useful farm wench. And those are her words, not mine. Her articles appear in such places as Wired.com, Christian Science Monitor, Literary Mama, Life Learning Magazine, Holistic Parenting, and many others. Laura is also the author of a poetry collection titled Tending and is at work on her next book, Laura, welcome to our program. Thank you for inviting me, Rebecca. I'm so excited. I did tell Laura before we started recording that if I could come back as a blog writer, I would definitely come back as her. She's one of my favorites. I've actually posted quite a bit. I mean, if you're a regular listener and follow me on Facebook or Twitter, I have retweeted and you know posted some of her things because I love it so much. So I'm so excited that she joined us. Laura, do you want to go ahead and briefly tell us a little bit more about yourself? Well, I work as a editor on our little farm, which is a bit of earth. I think you threw heaven in there. Which, Did I do that? You, yeah. <laughs> it sounds just, uh, like heaven. <laughs> <laughs> I think you just channeled. And uh, I have four kids and we have homeschooled for part of their part of their education. They were in school initially. The youngest is off at college. So I now am, you know, moving past that particular stage. And this time of year is pretty busy around here. We have a lot of harvesting to do and a lot of canning and freezing and dehydrating and that sort of thing. So looking forward to autumn. That is great. And do you want to tell us a little bit more about the inspiration behind your blog and how that began? Well, when my first book was ready to be published, pretty much the publisher insisted I have an author site. So (laughs) because I have so much to say, I have been posting an article on there every week anyway. So it's regularly updated, that's for sure. That is great. And and like I said, I love her posting. So, And let's talk a little bit, I guess, a little bit more about your family and how, you know, you said that some of your kids were homeschooled. What did your educational journey look like, you know, that led you to do what you're doing now? Well, you know, it was it was a kind of a different impetus to homeschool each one of my kids. The youngest was just going into kindergarten, and he was a very bright and engaging little boy, but he was virtually silent in kindergarten. He just, kids were loud and kind of bullying, and he seemed to be retreating in a lot of ways. He also was an early reader, and they, every week, went over a new sight word. He'd have to spend a whole week on the word like run, and the next week on jump, and it just seemed very uh, stifling to him. My next oldest child was in third grade and a a very lively and happy little person with many of his own interests. And his teacher insisted that he had ADHD and was a problem in the classroom and that sort of thing. And when we went to get him tested, indeed, he was labeled with that. And school wasn't a good fit for him either. My daughter was in fifth grade and reading at home, you know, high school level books with great enthusiasm and doing a lot of her own science explorations. But she was really held back in school. I remember in fifth grade, she was reading Mouse and the Motorcycle, which is something she'd read when she was, you know, maybe seven. And it really came to a head with our oldest child. He was a freshman in high school and he'd been telling me uh, all year about you know, these kids who were had formed kind of a gang and uh, they'd threatened kids and they'd broken somebody's arm and they had assaulted wow. a girl in the 
bathroom. But, you know, I volunteered with the schools and I would ask the teachers and the principal and they would say, oh, you know, those are rumors. And then he called one morning from school before classes started. And he said one of these kids had a gun and showed him a gun and said he wasn't going to live through the day. So there I am at home with (laughs) babysitting some, some babies. And I said, run, you have to run. And when I uh, called the school to report it, they never, they never called the police. Um, they didn't search the kids. And the police came to our house later and said everything my son had told me about the problems in school were true. So that, that was the last day my kids went to school. Well, I don't blame you. That is terrifying. So, and much. especially, I mean, I mean, what time frame was that? Because it seems like now anybody makes a threat about that and it, they're all over it, almost to a point where it's, you know, it's a little like calm down a little, but. Yeah, it was well after Columbine and that sort of thing, but it was, it was an award-winning school district and they just wanted no hint of of trouble to to even be spoken of. So it was, you know, they, the friends of mine who were up in arms about that, they said, this is the word of one kid against the other, even though my kid, and that doesn't mean everything, but he was, you know, in honors classes and that kid, he, who had the gun had already been in a juvenile detention facility. So, you know, one seems a little more believable than the other. Yeah. Wow. Well, and you've even had an educational journey change. I mean, as I've read your blog post, at least that's what I'm gathering from when you began homeschooling to what you're doing now. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that and how it's changed, you know, with a little bit of experience of homeschooling? You know, it's so fascinating. All of us, well, most of us were educated in school. So we have that mindset that kids learn all the time. Sure. But it, it matters what they learn in school. That's what counts. That's if it's measurable and gradable and that sort of thing. And I had been particularly told with my gifted kids that that should be left to experts. And I could, you know, we don't want to screw that sort of thing up. So, you know, to my shame, I, well, it's, I guess shame is not the right word, but to my dismay, I really replicated some of those school things in our, our early, you know, say our first year of homeschooling where I had school-like expectations. And even though I was encouraging my kids to follow their interests and studying subjects kind of within that framework, it didn't work particularly well with my child who had that ADD label in school. And I noticed that the more, you know, I tried to impose those sorts of things, the more I was seeing the exact problems the teacher had been talking about. You know, he would drop a pencil and crawl after it on the floor and he would stare out the window. And it didn't matter if we were going to the park, you know, as the minute he got done with his math, he just he was just super reluctant to do that. And I, I gradually realized how much he was learning outside of things like worksheets. And he was uh, building complicated uh, models that he had designed on his own. And he was reading adult level reference books about airplanes and did all sorts of nature explorations and did amazing kind of graphic design drawings. I mean, And I realized he was already educating himself and I was kind of holding him back with my expectations. Wow. And he, um, I mean, talking about your son a little bit, do you feel like, too, they were doing it joyfully when they are doing it on their own versus what, I mean, sounded like with uh, what you were trying to do was a little bit more drudgery for him. Is that what you would say? Yeah. And, you know, each kid is so different. My daughter has always been so driven to learn in very traditional academic ways. So uh, she would ask for things like Latin books and reference books. And, you know, one year for Christmas, she wanted a dissection set with a scalpel and formaldehyde and those poor little animals floating around in the the (laughs) jars and stuff. That kind of stuff really excited her. And it does feel kind of like a leap into the unknown to just set your kids free in as many ways as you can. Yeah, because, it's scary. <laughs> you know, you, much as I, you know, grew to embrace this kind of learning, I still had my nights where I'm lying awake wondering if they're ever going to understand division or, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> and what was astonishing to me is that uh, all four of my kids have ended up in college, which was, you know, not necessarily a choice they had to make. And without really formal education in, in the sciences, for example, they excelled. They were thrilled and excited. They couldn't understand why their fellow students were so turned off. And, you know, all they really wanted to know is, is this going to be on the test? And even with what looks like a lack of formal education, they actually were better qualified to learn on their own because they had been doing it for so long and, and doing it eagerly. 
Wow, that's pretty cool. And I want you to tell our audience a little bit more about like your blog, because it's not listed as like a homeschooling blog. Tell us a little bit more about what they can find on there and, you know, what you really focus on. You know, I, I didn't know how it was listed, so that's interesting. <laughs> I do write a lot about natural learning and a lot of very direct, useful ways to do that. I also write about things that excite me, which goes in all sorts of directions. And it has a lot to do with kind of living gently on the earth and treating each other kindly. But I, I stroll off into sarcasm and poetry and <laughs> uh, silly ideas. I, I wrote recently about the benefits of being an eccentric. Whatever is amusing to me or interesting to me, whatever I'm reading about or doing is pretty much what ends up in there. <laughs> well, and maybe that's why I love it because <laughs> that's kind of my <laughs> my the way my brain works too. It, it, you, you end go. up so, just doing what you love. <laughs> so yeah, so that's great. Yeah, and that's- and your uh, blog too it talks a lot about self education and how do you think self education leads to better education and we kind of talked about that with your son and with your your kids of how they like science but you know give us some meat i guess behind that well i'm i'm somewhat of a skeptic about a lot of things and i really like the data i i like to see research on things and what's fascinating about research on self education is how you know, we have the idea that uh, education has to do with instruction. And, you know, the research says that instruction actually impedes learning, that we as humans learn by exploring and discovering and figuring out it's a very active process. And there were two studies I could tell you about briefly that I thought were really illuminating. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about them. Great. One is about um, took babies, um, kind of the crawling, early walking stage babies. And babies are great to study because they are a very clear representation of how we learn. And they're not kind of addled by all the cultural differences. And what they did with these babies is they presented them with a toy that had a number of functions, five or six functions. And half the time, the researcher showed the baby the toy, and showed the baby one of these functions or two. Well, what happened is the babies played almost exclusively with the functions they'd been shown, and if they did some kind of exploratory play with it, they might have discovered one or two other functions, but they didn't play with it very long, and it wasn't that engaging. And the other half of the kids, the researcher would give them the toy and show them nothing. And those kids played with it longer, they discovered many of the functions on their own, and they also played with it in ways that were creative and unexpected by the adults. So their their process of learning was not impeded by instruction. And I think wow. that's fascinating. Yeah, kind of going back to what you felt like with your son, that you're, yeah. you're holding yeah. him back. Well, and the other study I thought was interesting, and there are all sorts of these, was with children who were maybe nine or 10 years old, and they had gone with their mothers to a program about writing poetry or short stories. And the, you know, the researchers observed the, the kind of uh, involvement the mother had. And mothers who were over-involved, which I certainly can be uh, guilty of, made a lot of suggestions, a lot of encouraging sort of sounds and, you know, helped steer the story in ways or, you know, add details as their child was working on it. And the other half, the mothers were very supportive. They were interesting, but they they hung back. They let the kid make their own choices and do their own things. They had very few suggestions. They were present supportively, but not instructionally. And when they talked to the kids after the class, the kids whose mothers had been pretty over-involved felt very little ownership of what they had written. It didn't feel like theirs. They weren't excited about it. They weren't eager to talk about it. And they weren't all that interested in going back to the program. And when impartial observers looked at the stories, they found them less creative. And the kids whose mothers were not too instructional, they were just supportive, those kids were super excited. They wanted to tell everybody about it. They wanted to read it. They wanted to come back and do it again. They felt a lot of ownership. So even in our kids' creativity, that kind of instruction and over-involvement and structure just doesn't, it doesn't bring forth what we're hoping it will. Yeah. Well, and I think my biggest struggle with kind of taking on the free learning, you know, philosophy, like to the full extent, is that fear I mean, we grew up with so much compulsion that I felt like, you know, if 
I mean, do you really feel like, I mean, do we feel like that children have to be pushed in order to learn? I mean, how do you get that over that as a parent? I mean, how do you free yourself from that? I mean, maybe it just takes experience, but. I think it has a lot to do with trusting kids. And since we were not trusted in that way by the educational experts in our childhood, it's, it's a process. It's kind of I think we evolve as as parents in many ways, but particularly in homeschooling ways, we have to keep observing our kids and we have to look at the messages they're telling us. As I was very slow to learn when my son kept dropping his pencil and falling out of his chair, you know, not he was he was being very true to himself and he did it sweetly and amusingly. He wasn't uh, horrible, but it took me a long time to understand that the what he was was doing on his own had so much more richness to it. And I I wouldn't say in our early days that we came in any way close to unschooling, but but I I started to understand that the way humanity has always learned has been unlike what we impose in school. So we're actually imposing so much more on narrow way of learning that we actually kind of, we kind of smother it. So people aren't even you know, you get, have to get to be, say, 30 or 40 years old before you start thinking, what am I really passionate about? And what if, you know, what did I lose along the way? Yeah. Before we go on, let us take a minute and hear about our sponsors. Hey, Firestarters. This is Mark, producer of The Luminous Mind. If you're like me, the thought of going out to the store and shopping is enough to make you want to crawl in a hole and hide. If that's you, then do your shopping online through Amazon. Just go to theluminousmind.net, click on the Amazon link, and shop away. Also, most of the books and resources that Rebecca and her guests discuss can be found on our Amazon links as well. Again, if you're like me, you have already accidentally signed up for Amazon Prime. So most of those purchases should have free shipping as well. Good luck! to the Luminous Mind with Laura Grace Weldon of Free Range Learning, Creative Living, and Gentle Encouragement. Well, and your blog talks about being a gentle encouragement. I mean, how do we be a gentle encouragement yet not get, you know, <laughs> you know, not be the, the mother that's in there too much, you know, stifling that learning? What are some, I mean, I, I know my youngest, uh, I'm just actually watching him <laughs> play on the computer. I'm afraid if I totally left him to his own devices sometimes that that's all he would do. But <laughs> what's the gentle encouragement that mothers can give? Well, you know, specifically about screen time, and I, I'm pretty sure I'm the minority in the unschooling world. You know, I kind of liken it to they, they did old studies where they would give babies a free reign to eat whatever they wanted. And babies would eat things like liver and raw cabbage and stuff, kind of balancing their own bodies. But that only worked if they were providing them nothing but the, the, the wholest foods. When they started to offer you know, candy and sweets, the kids could no longer guide themselves and what was appropriate. And I kind of see screens as a suite. So they're, they're awesome. And I spent a lot of time on them. And my kids definitely did as they got older. But particularly in the earlier years, we had a family rule and that applied to the adults too, that we did not use screens during what we what would have been a normal school day. So we were outside or we were fooling around in the kitchen or reading books or doing whatever. And it just wasn't, it wasn't a possibility. So there was no reason to nag about it. And so in that way, you know, we've, it almost kind of foists kids more onto their own resources than, than the entertainment that's right there, which I admit I enjoy as well. Yeah. One of the hallmarks of a truly creative individual, when they look at highly um, creative adults who are, you know, they might be surgeons or woodworkers or whatever, but they had in their childhood a lot of time to indulge in what's called world play, where they make up their own worlds, which is where The Hobbit came from, by the way, from childhood, from a childhood imagining. And when we don't leave kids, a, a lot of this kind of free time to just, you know, be inside their own minds and daydream and come up with ideas 
it's we're kind of we're kind of short. What is that word? Short circuit. Yeah, for changing them or something. And, you know, short change. There you go. And definitely as my kids got older, they spent more time on the computer and, you know, found friends from around the world they played games with. And it was wonderful. But I think particularly in the early years, it's really important to just leave that time for them. Yeah. Well, and I watch my son, uh, he will make up a story, like you said, outside, and then he'll write about it. So that's good encouragement. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, so, yes. Well, and I know, too, that I'm probably, like you said, I'm the worst example of that because I, I work, you know, on the computer. And so, yeah, me too. so yeah. great. Awesome. All right. So what would you change about your education to make it more supportive to your mission? Do you feel? What would I change about what I have done with the kids? No, with or your change, own, I, your own personal, yeah, or your, oh, or whatever. You know, tell me some stories. <laughs> <laughs> what would I change about my education? Oh wow, I was uh, a bookish little kid, and I became a bookish adult. But I spent, um, I grew up in a far less stymied childhood time, so we were given a lot of freedom, and you know, I would have spent more time exploring. My, my sister and I. One summer, uh, I guess it's not a change story, but it's just what kids can do with that much freedom. We were signed up for a summer park program, and you would go sign yourself in, and you'd have these teenage camp counselors, and they would teach how to make lanyards, or uh, they had baton twirling classes. They had all sorts of like very stereotypical 70s things. And <laughs> um, my older sister, who was far braver than I, decided that she just wouldn't sign in, and she would just spend the day on her own and ride her bike wherever she wanted to go because we you know, went the half mile on our bikes. And I tried to be the dutiful little girl for a while and keep going. But the the lure of not going was too great. So I would just take my little packed lunch and ride my little pink bike all over the place. And I went miles, I made it from our Cleveland area home over to Lake Erie, I went through construction sites, and I got lost all the time. And I would have that horrible panic, I will never see my mom again. And, <laughs> and every time, I figured it out and I backtracked and I talked to, you know, guys out walking their dogs and old ladies watering their flowers. And for a quite kind of anxious little kid, these, this was a really pivotal experience for me to have that much freedom. And I would have more of that freedom if I could go back and, and change anything. Yeah. I, I can't imagine uh, parents. I mean, in our day and age now, I mean, you can't even let your child play out in the yard anymore. <laughs> Or oh without gosh. somebody calling the child protective services on on them. So and I guess on the on a farm, like you said, where you you have your own bit of heaven is what I, I called it. But <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um and, and so do you allow your kids I mean, they're out doing those types of things then and, and out on the farm? Yeah, they they have always been extraordinarily helpful on the farm and we wouldn't have been able to do this without them. And in some ways, though, it has limited them because, especially as my youngest said, he never lived in town. So the kinds of things I did, you know, just like pal up with a bunch of neighborhood kids or, you know, go carousing around and, and, and that's you know, like I did on my little bike. <laughs> he, hasn't, he hasn't really had that option. He's had to be driven more, although he's also made bike trails in the woods and, you know, done all sorts of things. But it, it, what's bizarre about this whole clamping down on kids' freedom is we are depriving them of these pivotal experiences of making mistakes and getting hurt and, you know, kind of figuring out with neighborhood kids how to organize their social lives. And we're finding out now that, that they're, they're not getting the kind of emotional intelligence that they need to grow easily into adulthood and be successful in whatever way that, that calls to them. Well, and another thing I've heard or read, and maybe you can either, you know, you chime in on this when I get done with it, but is that we're actually creating kids that have a lot of anxiety because we're all so fearful, you know, of like what, what can happen to them and, you know, that type of thing that we're creating that anxiety. We're creating kids that feel really almost handicapped, you know, that they don't dare make some choices because cause they're afraid of what could happen. What's your... Yeah, we've got to... We've gotten to a bizarre point of not trusting kids. And when I was first out of college, I got a job at a nursing home. And my, my buddies were all these people in their 80s and 90s. And the stories they told me about growing up, I guess they would have been kids in the 1900s and 1910s and that sort of thing. Um, they were horrible by our today's standards. Mm -hmm. They did overt criminal action for fun on a regular basis. <laughs> 
<laughs> and, and, you know, it was assumed that they're kids and they would grow out of it. And, you know, like the very worst things that they did, you know, they might get a ride home in the, the sheriff's car and get a little talking to, but they, they had no criminal records. They weren't locked up. They weren't handcuffed as we do for elementary school kids now. And every one of these people who had done truly outrageous things in childhood grew up to be productive citizens. They had long marriages. They had, you know, stable jobs. They volunteered. They were just extraordinary people. But if we had labeled them at 13 as, you know, criminals, you know, as we're doing now, it would be entirely different. Yeah, I do agree with that. That does make a lot of sense. Uh, sometimes making some really bad choices helps you grow and be a better person in the long run. And when we don't let them kind of recover from that, it, I think we stifle some growth there. So, I think we've kind of forgotten that childhood is a time to be childish. And if we don't just kind of embrace that and expect, well, they know that wasn't appropriate or what made you do that, we've forgotten that they're children and they're supposed to make mistakes. Yeah. It's not going to all be perfect. Well, and I see a lot of adults that just finally are tired of being adults and run away. And sometimes I wonder if we let them make those, you know, sow those wild oats like we talked about, that maybe they would stick around and take on that responsibility, you know, that they wouldn't feel like they they had to do it after they had families and children and stuff like that. But anyway. Absolutely. All right. Do you have some mentors maybe that helped you along the way and made a significant difference in your, you know, how your paradigm was changed? Well, I did a lot of those mistakes. Um, <laughs> the, the first the first homeschooling mom I met was named Mary, and she had a big family and did all sorts of things. And she ran what she called a book group. And it was super relaxed. It was entirely different than what I had imagined. And the kids largely went so they could go play softball in their big yard afterwards. And, you know, I did what we called book group with very small non-reading kids, three, four-year-olds, five-year-olds. And we mostly, they would make up stories and then they would like act it out with puppets or they would make up stories and then they would pretend sword fight off of the swing set. And Mary's completely relaxed way of just having a house full of art projects and and cool things going on that that was truly inspiring to me. And I wanted to be more like that. Yeah, that's great. It's wonderful when you can find a good mentor like that. So do you yeah. want to do you want to tell us a little bit more about your book about your poetry collection tending and then also what your next book is that you're working on? Well, I have what I call sideways procrastination. And so I, so I work as, I work as an editor and I have deadlines and there are things I'm supposed to do. And that's when I feel most creatively inspired to do anything but that, which is, what, which is when I cook weird things or write poetry or in some way procrastinate sideways. So I'm getting something else done, but not what I'm supposed to do. So that's where the poetry collection came from. So procrastination is, um, is a good thing sometimes. And that book is mostly, you know, it's got a lot to do with, with nature and looking at the world around us and, and that sort of thing. So that was just a joy for me. And free range learning is, it kind of grew out of, I was writing a column for the time for Home Education Magazine, and I got so many questions for people about, you know, how do I, how do I homeschool without a curriculum or how do I, you know, they were very, I got a lot of worksheet sort of questions, you know, how can I make kids learn about astronomy or something? And so I kept writing more and more things about, well, you know, here are 50 ways that you can encourage kids to love books, or, you know, here are 20 ways that you can teach kids to be media savvy, or, you know, here's an approach to volunteering or something. And people seemed really hungry for that. So half of the, the second half of free range learning is all open-ended ideas for, you know, making any subject interesting. The first half is quite a bit about how all of us are natural learners and how to see that and how to bring that forth. That sounds wonderful. So, I mean, do you want to talk about a little bit more about some of your blog posts that you've written? We've discussed it a little, but maybe some services that um, people can find on your blog. Well, I've got a lot of subject areas. If you just go there and you, you know, you want to learn more about uh, early education or uh, math or raising kids mindfully or any of those sorts of things, there are many things to click upon. And it's kind of evolved where I, I spend a lot more time talking about body-based learning and uh, recognizing our kids' intuition and just the sorts of things that I'm interested in right now. 
That's great. So what are <laughs> what are some successes that you've seen with the free range learning and with your book? I was like looking I, I, at the very beginning. I say that you're an author of the free range learning. I'm like, when did I miss that? <laughs> so <laughs> tell us a little bit more about that, what you've seen with your books, success you've seen with your books and your blog and also like you know, with your own family? Well, success with, you know, writing articles or books is very small and hard to see many times, but it makes my day or my week at the very least when, when people say, you know, I changed the way I think about this, or, you know, I'm, I'm doing things differently, or my family is so much more relaxed now. And that, that is priceless. There's, there's nothing better than that. And I forgot the second half of your question. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe success that you've even seen with your own family. One example of my kind of learning along with the kids is a science club that I started with a bunch of other moms. It ended up being a boys science club because that's the age group of kids we had at the time. And when we first started it, you know, we were very over-involved perhaps, but the kids were, I don't know, between like seven and 10 or 11. And so we would go to each other's houses and the mom who's, you know, arranged it would have this project all laid out and the kids would follow these prescribed steps. And if there were mistakes, the, you know, the parent would try to figure out, okay, well, why didn't that work? And they were the ones that, you know, ran the show. And as the boys got older and as we got a little more laid back, they just started coming up with their own projects and figuring out their own resources and looking things up. And as they did them, they, they made mistakes too. And they, they figured out on their own why it didn't work and they would have a project. And instead of just like, okay, well, we're done with that. They would, they would be excited enough that they would extrapolate that into three more projects and use the whole afternoon. They also did stuff that was far more challenging than we ever would have come up with. They made things like a 12 foot tall trebuchet, to hurl wow. pumpkins. They um, made a hovercraft that actually got off the ground. They were disappointed because it didn't carry a passenger, but it did get off the ground. <laughs> they made uh, spud guns. They did all kinds of stuff. You know, they were not only having fun, but they were learning all of these principles that we were not hovering right over them and saying, well, this is the law of thermodynamics or whatever. We were just, you know, we were just off doing our own thing and letting them do their thing. And Interestingly, out of all of those boys, quite a few of them have gone into the sciences. So it definitely inspired them. That is neat. That's a really neat way to look at it. So and uh, you talked about teaching yourself, being able to to read and research on your own while they're doing their thing. Have you read any books that you find are the most influential and that have kind of helped you? Wow. I read so many books. I am definitely addicted to the library system. And uh, <laughs> I can think of some that have been particularly interesting recently. I, I love Richard Louv's, um Last Child in the Woods. I love Marcy Axness's book, Parenting for Peace. Bill Plotkin's Nature and the Human Soul. Bernie DeCoven's uh, A Playful Path. I mean, I could just, wow. I, could, I could do this for a long time. <laughs> That's great. So do you have any like long-term goals for yourself or what kind of legacy do you hope you're going to leave? <laughs> Oh, my. I would hope that, you know, I think writers are so into self-expression. And I hope that I'm expressing kind of a, a gentle soul approach to people of all ages. And so if I have made things a little gentler and in some way, that would be marvelous. We need more people like that that do that kind of thing. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so before we say goodbye, do you have any final parting words of advice for our listeners? And then just go ahead and give us your contact information of how we can get in touch with you. Oh, I've got all sorts of advice. Let's see if I can hone that down to a small amount. Mm -hmm. For homeschoolers, I would, would have a couple things. First, I would encourage people to build their own knowledge networks that are around all of us. The, the people we know and the people that those people know are a huge um, web of knowledge and passion about things that, that we may not be. And so when we ask kids to share something they know, never ask them to teach because that scares people, you know, they kind of transmit that, that sort of excitement and wonder to our kids. And it's a, it's a way of honoring people. So I would encourage people to kind of expand on the networks that are available to them. And I would encourage people to let kids do meaningful things, to really, truly participate at home and in the community. I have lots of articles about that. They're building character and they're getting this sense of meaning that, that we can't assign them. 
And I guess I could throw one more in there, and that's just to listen to your intuition because you're the one who adores that child and you're the one who kind of has that inner sense already about your child. And I think when we pay attention to our intuition, we're also teaching our kids to pay attention to their kind of gut feelings and that's a vital form of education. Yeah, we are definitely their mentors on how to be an adult and how to do those things too. I love yeah. too about having them do meaningful things. I think too many young people just don't feel the purpose. You know, they don't have a purpose in life anymore. And that really is creating some really sad situations in our community. So thank you. It's a, it's a weird dynamic because, you know, throughout human history, kids imitated the adults around them and wanted to become more and more capable and wanted to be real members of the community contributing. And when we take that away from kids, we've kind of left them in this awful situation where they don't feel that their their lives have a purpose and value to the larger community. And that's a bad feeling. Yeah. One of my past guests talked about how we segregate them. You know, we and I'm like, wow, I've never really thought about that. But we do. We segregate them, you know, to a school where they aren't part of that community. Okay. Yeah, I've got I've got a couple articles about making kids part of the community and ways that we can do that. So I would encourage people to go check that out. Great. Well, we'll have to um, attach some to the show notes. Speaking of how to get a hold of you, can you, get, you <laughs> want to go ahead and give us your contact information? You can visit my site. It's lauragraceweldon.com. That's pretty easy. I also have a pretty busy Facebook page. It's called Free Range Learning Community and lots of lively conversation going on there. I'm Ernest Drollery on Twitter. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't tweet a whole lot, but that's where I am. And yeah, I think that would probably do it. I do have a, a contact form if people are you know interested in coaching or any of that sort of thing. And yeah, that's that's my story, I guess. Great. Well, thank you. It's been an honor to talk to you. Like I said, I am a follower of your work and I just really enjoy your blog posts and stuff. So thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Rebecca. It's an honor to be called a fire starter. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. To learn more about Laura Grace Weldon and to see examples of her blog, go to our show notes at theluminousmind.net. Be sure to become a subscriber to our free email list and consider joining our program by going to the scheduling tab to become a fire starter today. Help support the podcast by making all your Amazon purchases through the free Amazon widget on our website. Also, sign up to receive two free audiobooks from Audible at theluminousmind.net. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Google+, and now Pinterest. Get our audio content by subscribing on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. To help us grow, consider telling your friends about us. Leave us a review. Tell us how we can help you so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education. 